Amos, in your talk, uh, there was a point where you started to introduce pricing as a new component to this data set. Uh, what, what are the prospective outlooks for huh. data in that space? You're a chemist. Your, your background yeah. is a chemist. Have you done anything with financial time series regressions? I have not. So financial time series regression, in a basic linear regression, we say that a conditioned variable um, is, you know, the, the dependent variable is conditioned on the independent variable, and there's some usually linear coefficient. Uh, if you think about how that would work with a financial time series, what you'd be saying is that the price is equal to some coefficient times time. That means the price would be a straight line going some way up, hopefully, maybe down, who knows. That's obviously not how prices work in the real world. A slightly more complex model is called an autoregressive model where what we say is that the price at time t is conditioned on the price at times t minus one times some coefficient plus some random distribution. So it's linear over short time frames. Well, what we'd say is that it's a random walk. Gotcha. Um, that what's, uh, that what's uh, where the randomness is in, the rand is in the movement from yesterday's price. So this would be more in line with like a Monte Carlo type model well, of simulation. We're not there yet. We're okay. only at AR1. We're not we're not close to where we're going. Okay. So at AR1, we say that the randomness is in the price movement from one day to the next, and we say that those price movements are drawn from a common shared distribution. But that's not really how pricing works either, because as we saw in the financial crisis, volatility is uh, not constant over time. We have periods, periods of high volatility and we have periods of low volatility. And so we can move from an AR model to what we call an ARCH model, which is an autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity model, where we say that the price movement at time x, uh, that the sigma uh, at time t, or rather, let's go away from x, let's stick with time t, um, that the sigma at time t is conditioned on sigma at time t minus one. And we can even become more sophisticated than that, and we can go to a generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity model um, where we say that volatility is uh, seasonal, volatility is periodically conditioned, and so forth. That only gives us, though, a single price. It gives us a good, a good estimate of what volatility is going to be in the price risk for the near term, but only for a single price point. But we can take our Garch model, and we can lay it out in a multivariate normal model. And if we lay out our GARCH in a multivariate normal, it becomes a model called a C-cubed GARCH, where sigma at each point is related to the sigma and the price movements uh, of the other prices in our model. So and sigma now is dynamic. Well, our sigma, instead of being a single, um, in, a, in, a, in a single price model, uh, whether it's a, uh, AR or GARCH, sigma is a, so is one to, number, it's a scalar. But do you go on to regress those model. then? Well, but in, part of, in a multivariate model though, um, sigma is a symmetric uh, positive definite matrix. Okay. Okay. Um, because it has to relate the covariance of every price to every other price. Gotcha. And that's the concept that I was trying to introduce in short form today, which is that in Connect, we have positions in Connect that are related to each other according to the economic substitutability of two different strains. How close or distant two strains are from each other is how good they are as substitutes. If you think about that, and if you think about how that should relate to a pricing model, their substitutability is inversely proportional, or should be inversely proportional, to the covariance of the price shocks, which means that our connect distances have a natural relationship to the sigma matrix in that C cubed Garch model. And it becomes possible at that point, if you tried to figure out the price, this is what I was alluding to today, if you try and figure out the price of a strain tomorrow, when that strain hasn't traded in five months, because there are thousands of strains, and they don't trade that often, if you tried to figure out the price of that strain tomorrow, when it hasn't traded in five months, and do that directly, you would have a very rough time. You're not going to be able to do that. On the other hand, if you have a covariance matrix, and you have intervening prices in that intervening five months for other prices in that covariance matrix, then you can have a pretty well-grounded estimate 
of what the new price will be for this strain that hasn't traded before, or that hasn't traded recently. And then these are wholesale prices. I don't worry about the retail level. We're a, uh, a company that operates at the wholesale level. Right, the market, and so, right? Yeah, and, so, and what this lets us do is to predict not an individual, this is your likely price tomorrow. It lets us predict a pretty narrow range of probabilistic prices for not today, but for a week from today, two weeks from today, a month from today. And that lets us help people to figure out what price they can expect to obtain and help people price their product on the market. Right, so you're talking about enabling uh, a, what's now a commodity and now giving futures uh, to that commodity. You're a, a very insightful is person, that, Vaughn. That's is that the in fact, you're heading? That, that's exactly the direction we're heading, is to figure out, to be able to accurately estimate not just the price, but what's the price risk over the next month, two months, six months. Sure. How much volatility is there in the market? How much volatility is going to be associated with the strain, with the price of this strain, and so forth? That's how other commodities are priced, and we would like to be able to start doing that as cannabis moves um, into an ordinary commodity. That is to say, a commodity that's readily available, that's efficiently priced, um, where uh, buyers can get a reliable stream of commerce. Um, that's the kind of risk assessment that you need to be able to do. Interesting. Could you, as a chemist? Um, could you take a similar model and apply it to statements about the potency of cannabis? Is cannabis becoming more potent over time or less potent? Or is it stagnating out? Could you apply it to questions like, are we seeing more uh, what, what are referred to as indicas uh, versus sativas, more uppers or downers? Can, could we get a sense of well, indicas and what's sativas, out on the market? Indicas and sativas are chemically indistinguishable. Right. We see no significant differentiation between indicas and sativas. But There's a little bit of a tendency. What's, what's down? There's a little bit of a tendency for, for sativas to have more terpinaline, but that's it. I don't know that there are uppers and downers distinctions that, are, that I can find chemically. Okay. Um, is the amount of THC growing? Yes, there is. If you're selling cannabis as flour, there are people who walk into the dispensary and what they're going to pick is what has the most THC in it. Give me the stuff that's the strongest. Give me the most THC for my THC dollar. And so producers are marketing to that. And I, I have to tell you, I think from the consumer's perspective, I think they're making a terrible mistake. If you have cannabis that has more than you know, 20%, 25% THC in it, there's a limit to how high you can get. And there's certainly a limit to how high you want to get. And it's hard for most people, myself included, but really anybody that we've talked to, any, any, whenever we've done research into this, people are much happier with a cannabis that's 10% THC and 10% CBD than they are with a cannabis that's 35% THC. Yeah, You're going to get, and, uh, frankly, too high. But nevertheless, that's what producers are moving towards. And the other place where producers are moving towards very high THC amounts is in production for extraction. There's certainly demand for very high THC, very high CB, you know, very high cannabinoid content for sale to extractors. Um, consumers would probably be happier if they focus less on getting as much THC as they can and more on getting a balance of other psychoactive chemicals in their in their cannabis. Well, thank you, Amos. Thank you very much, Ron. Appreciate Vaughan. it. <laughs>